You, you know, what I've asked this group to talk about is, we, we've identified this already today and we've sort of talked about it, but we haven't really given a lot of specifics. The challenges of getting advisors and students at potentially the college and the high school level engaged and involved in this. Everything from how do we get them to tell their stories um, to um, how do we actually get them enthused about participating in the process. So John, let me let you go first. Thanks, Mark. I hope my voice will stay together. It kind of goes in and out. Somewhere it was out near Columbus a little earlier this morning. Um, we've talked about a lot of things this morning. We've covered a lot of the topics that my original questions dealt with. So I think what I would start with this is number one, to ask anybody in the audience to participate with, with to the, based on the questions or based on the answers. And then to ask your own questions of the group as they may come along. Um, group, maybe Kathy first. What would you add specifically that wasn't talked about this morning in terms of getting people involved or protecting sources or any issue? Well, I, this day has been such a, it's been exhausting and energizing at the same time um, because it's so, we're so all on the same page. Um, but we, we could have done a better job, I think, in the past, um, pulling together more of a coalition. Um, we did get some great testimony from, from students. I'm feeling like one of the areas where we're still struggling is really involving the university and college level um, people in this fight. Um, it's almost, there's almost this, not among all of them, but there's kind of an ambivalence, even at the University of Washington, um, almost as though, well, we don't really need to worry about this. We're never going to be, we're never going to be censored here. Um, and also connecting themselves with high school. Um, the last time, or it might have been the time before we tried to pass the legislation, there was this, this sort of push back on, you know, we, we being connected with the high school isn't to our best interest, the high school um, uh, fight. And, and I, I want to address that a little more aggressively this time uh, to try to, to go talk one-on-one -on -one with David Domke at the University of Washington, for example, because there, there really wasn't some, any active support there except from Diana Kramer, who uh, is the publisher, ad, adult publisher of the University of Washington Daily, which is kind of a strange position, it seems to me. But um, she used to be the director of our Washington Newspaper Publishers Association. So she did come and testify about how students coming into college um, are coming in with a fear of covering controversy. And she said it's because the high schools aren't, uh, that because they're being taught in high school to be way too careful. And that's a real concern of hers. I think I kind of got off point, but, but that's an area of interest to me and I would like to hear that discussed more, maybe not here today, we don't have time, but um, in the future. So, um, I would add, it, it was brought up during lunch or asked of me during lunch, you know, by having my kids uh, take part in writing their own, legis or their own testimony for legislation using this bill, this real bill at the, right, at the same time it was going through the process at the Capitol, uh, the question I was asked was, well, you know, did anyone come down on you about that because you're a teacher, you shouldn't be sharing political views, things like that. And I guess my answer to that would be, I didn't think about that. Um, I have a, this is my 12th year of advising in Bismarck and I, I number one, have a great relationship with the superintendent um, and I'm known as a, pretty radical teacher in that I have always taken my kids to where the action is. So when it 
came time for my kids to write this testimony. My kids had already been to Williston with me at the height of the oil boom. Um, I took them to Leith, North Dakota, and they did one of the first interviews with the mayor of Leith, and then later Craig Cobb, the white supremacist, and the neo-Nazi guy, Chef Shop, or Jeff Shop. So when I wanted to do this you know, mock thing in my classroom and then bring a busload of kids, which Frank was on that bus that day, um, so was Mary Beth Tinker, and my kids were riding with them to the Capitol. Um, it was just how I, I operate and what I do with my kids. So no one really questioned what I was doing, um, and I brought in the community. So when you have guests come into your school, like the editor of the local paper and Steve Andrus, and um, it just seemed natural. So I guess my suggestion would be to um, just start making that part of life. <laughs> that this shouldn't be something unusual that we ask our kids to do. Um, I will say too, I had a student who is nonverbal, severely handicapped, had recently received technology to where he could speak, and so he was new at it, his aides were new at it, and he was in my Journalism One class when I gave him this assignment, and within this kid who's been nonverbal for 16 years and had a voice finally, uh, he wrote testimony. And in the mock uh, session in my classroom, he gave his testimony via this uh, electronic equipment, and it was powerful. He came with us. We had to make sure we got a bus that was handicap accessible, and he came with us to the Capitol. Since then, he has been uh, an activist in our state for the, on the day of, you know, let's do away with the R word. So that little exercise in my class turned him into a first-class activist for things that are important to, to him. So I, I would say just do it. Uh, one thing I would, I, I would say, and we really haven't talked a lot about, is what not to do. Um, I heard later, but when we testified to the House, Steve Listopad and Frank were sitting behind me, so I didn't see this, but I was asked a question, I believe, about anonymous sources, and I said, we don't we don't, that, that's just our policy that we don't use them. In fact, in 10 years, we've used an anonymous source once and went on to tell in great detail about letting my kids write a story about a girl with a sex addiction who had gone for treatment. Well, Steve, afterwards, I was oblivious, said he had to physically hold Frank down uh, from <laughs> launching, like doing the dive where he takes me out. Um, and I was told really nicely by Frank after that, I think it was at dinner, um, let's not bring that up uh, when we testify to the Senate. So I, I learned a lot, and you know, I, a lot of hot cases were going on at that time. Frank was, as usual, on his phone. There was the condom-covered banana on the cover. There were all these things, and you know, we decided as a group not to not to lay down and not let our kids continue, but just not to really maybe actively pursue some hot things while we were in the session, so, yeah. But at the same time, and I'm gonna piggyback off something mm -hmm. what you just said, it's important for the students to have access to media literacy, especially in today's society where we live in these little social media silos. Yeah. And they're creating their own feed and they're getting their news that way. And by educating them on that, and even the, because if you have a robust program, your kids can get so much more out of it. Mm -hmm. And it's a civic engagement. Um, one of the things that we're having a hard time with is the outreach out state. The metro area, they're active, but out state, mm -hmm. they're not as active. So we've been brainstorming, we've been, you know, do we go up there? If we went up there, would they come? Um, so we had a lot of discussions about that and we actually are putting together an outreach aspect hopefully in the next week. Um, it's on the list. Also, what I'd like to see is a little more on how we deal with um, school boards, school board associations in which, I know the last time the bill in Minnesota was um, attempted to pass in the 1990s something. Um, I know the person, they were, NSPA was working on it and the school board association sat across the table arms folded and said, it's not going anywhere. So instead of having that, this is the line, you know, how do we better frame that conversation? So it's not so adversarial, because it shouldn't be. 
So I guess what I would do next is piggyback on what Sue started, and that's the idea of what other things would you recommend against? Mm -hmm. We've talked about lots of pluses and positives. Are there things that you folks would add, and Lori, Sue, Kathy, additional things that you would recommend that you not consider or suggest against? I think you need to pick your testimonial people very carefully. Yeah because it needs to be a journal journalistically responsible story that you're putting or content that you're putting out there. Um, you know, it's, it's a good time where they actually dot their I's and cross their T's and make sure their facts are right and they're working hard and it's ethically and legally sound, so. You know, it's <clears throat> picking your testimony, I, I don't know if the system is, it's probably different in every hearing, but, um, everywhere, but in Washington, um, our hearings, basically you don't know who's gonna be testifying until you get there. And it's a matter of people walking in the door and signing up to testify. And you can have your cherry picked list of who you want to testify and have them there and have them perfectly prepped. And you could have people you don't even know come in and sign up and testify in front of the people or ahead of the people who you want to testify and then you run out of run out of time and so it's i found it it's so stressful being in that hearing room and knowing that there are four people who you've never even heard of who have signed up in, ahead of the people who you want up there and not knowing whether those folks are actually going to get to testify. So it's, uh, that's something that, I don't know if there's anything that we can do to better control that. I mean, we try to be the first ones there if we can, but, um, but that's a real, been a real frustrating piece of, you know, one of those hot potato things that you just don't know where it's gonna land. And I would, I would add to that, uh, we sent Steve our testimony early, as early as we could so he could put it all together. Uh, quite a few of us testified and we wanted to make sure, Steve did a really good job about looking at all of it, making sure we weren't repeating each other. Uh, you don't have much time. In fact, I remember in the Senate, the chair said, oh my, the room was packed and how many of you are there? And he said, well, make it quick. Don't repeat what someone else has said. I just want to get this thing passed. He actually, uh, he actually said, uh, um, I'm inclined to, uh, to uh, approve this bill. Don't talk me out of it. Yes. <laughs> yes. And so that was so good to hear. In fact, we did try to keep it short, but we were just beaming during that testimony because we're like, you know, we've got this one in the bag. Something else I'll add I forgot to mention earlier is... Uh, you know, it passed the House and the Senate, and that's all great, and I was super excited. I learned a lot during the process until someone, probably Steve, said, yep, now the governor needs to sign it. And I was like, well, he will, right? <laughs> and, you know, when I learned there's a possibility that, well, he, he has the power to not sign it, um, I collected letters from two, three colleges and several high schools thanking the governor uh, prior to him signing it. Uh, and delivered that to the Capitol myself. So it's, it's always good to hear from students that thank you already for signing it. And then we were there and took a picture with him the day he signed it. So. That's a really good point. Three states have bills passed by their legislators mm -hmm. by the governor. So yep. um, you don't want to be in that situation, Bob. Go ahead. Um, just uh, definitely having your people give them a time limit as far as in talking to your sponsor to see how, how much time each one to speak. So in advance, but the other big thing that, that um, we were told that came, became a concern was, was reading. They, they didn't want to hear, hear um, read testimony, you know, just written, reading from the written response. And so having a story to tell that isn't too, too much read. Uh -huh. I'm curious for, for you, Loria alluded to this, but for the other two of you, have you had buy-in by advisors in your states and students for that matter? I mean, and, and I don't mean just, you know, a handful showing up for testimony, but do you feel like they've been engaged in this process as well? Okay. Kathy and Sue? 
Um, we, we really have. Um, we have a summer workshop for advisors. I mean, we're, we're pretty heavy on the student press rights thing in our state, so they come, they come away with a pretty heavy dose. Uh, Lori was our expert in residence this past summer, so she can attest to that. Um, however, we don't get all the advisors there, so we also have two journalism days. We're, doing the, we're indoctrinating all the time, um, but we've, um, we have a lot of turnover, though, so as we get new advisors, you know, that's where it's the hardest because getting them up to speed. This is a lot of information, and some of these new advisors have absolutely no idea what they're getting themselves into um, in terms of just the legal pieces of what they're going to be doing, and um, because most don't come in with any journalism background, as you know. Um, and so getting new advisors and new people up to speed and getting them to buy in, it's a lot to drop on them um, all at once, and so it often doesn't happen overnight. So, so we just, it's just something that's an ongoing um, thing. I found that when Joe Fain spoke at our journalism day, uh, that's our senator, our senator, um, at our journalism day, he was extremely engaging. His whole talk was about First Amendment and why it's important for students. And the number of kids and advisors who stayed afterwards when they had other options, they could have gone on media tours. On, this was on the University of Washington campus, but they chose not to do that. They chose to stay and hear more and ask questions. And, and so I think just once they've got the seed, once they've got the information coming in, they want more and, um, and it, it is exciting because things are happening and I think that, that also helps. Yeah, and I would say uh, students, yes, they were um, easily drawn in and became very passionate and willing to speak to um, learn more about it. Advisors, uh, although most I talked to were supportive, uh, very few uh, would, would, you know, go on record or, yeah, yeah, I believe it was just me and Jeremy Murphy and Fargo who really had an active part. There were a few others that were interested. Um, I know my counterpart in Bismarck, very interested, uh, didn't come to anything, didn't, you know, real hesitant. Um, which is a shame. I think that's, we've heard that already today is that they're hesitant to speak out about it where students are more apt to do that. Somebody else have able to locate alumni who might have stories. The school system really has oh, no Oh yeah, to we, had a, we had an ace in the hole with a young lady named Katie Winbauer who um, at the other high school in town and maybe that was some of the hesitation from her advisor uh, you know, there was some censorship there, and she was amazing. Uh, one of my former students who was at the uh, University of North Dakota, um, she was last to testify in the House, and the legislators asked her more questions than most of the others. So, yeah, definitely. The alumni were, and they had that freedom to speak out, more freedom. That's one thing we don't take enough advantage of, I think, are the mm -hmm. graduates of our programs who, you know, have gone on to lofty positions and may have an influence we don't think about. George. Picking up something on what you said, Kathy, a little earlier about speaking out, and then you just mentioned it again um, in your point. You mentioned, Kathy, that students are coming from high school and they're entering colleges and they don't, or even getting to the point where they could be helpful in making the case for these laws they are not recognizing the power that they can have just by speaking their mind. And someone said earlier today that that is the impact of, uh, quite frankly, um, of, of, our, of our environment that we're in. And then it's gotten worse, you know, based on what's happened in the last week or so. My question is, even if we're not talking about preparing them to speak at a hearing, or giving testimony, can we do something in our press associations 
to help our advisors and the students showing up for these conferences and workshops about the power of their voice. And that gets more to the campaign that, that uh, Frank mentioned earlier with the young ladies. Just in general, do you have some suggestions for how do we combat this reticence to speak out or speak their mind because they can get in trouble, they've got to get a recommendation for college. I mean, I'm just wondering about that. Or if they're coming into college and they've been in high school and they've had this chill, you know, what can we do about that as press associations? Well, I mean, we have a district, we have a district in Washington State that because of one of these two lawsuits that I referred to earlier, um, the superintendent imposed prior review on all three of the high schools in that district and passed this um, model, model policy that's kind of a boilerplate policy you see coming out of, where is it? Yeah, Yola. Um, and it's, it's a policy that is a recommended policy and and they passed it in Puyallup, which is where this case took place. And so those kids have now lived under mandatory prior review, all three high schools, for how many years now, Vince? Five or six years. And, and those students, their critical thinking skills have been, have been stunted there um, because they're afraid to think critically about issues of importance now. And so those kids are graduating and they're going into colleges and they're, they care about being in the media. They've stayed with their student media, but they've censored themselves so much that now they're in college where they're being told, you know, think critically, look at the world in this, in this new way and talk about it and voice your opinion. And they're, they're afraid to do that. And, you know, so we can't, it makes this, this legislation more important than ever. And I mean, that policy never would have passed in, our, in that district if this legislation had been in place. And so what am I saying here? I'm, am I answering your question? In terms of the associations, yeah. our, our press yeah. associations. And what can we do? I, I mean, that's, I mean, what we're doing here today is, is I guess, what we can do. I have one as well. One of the things that we're putting forth is the Making a Difference campaign. We've re-energized that. Anything you can do to send those stories that have made an impact on that community to us, and I'm talking to us, John, Candace, and I have all worked on this. And what we want to do is we want to put together a group of st stories or a group of coverage in which students have made this impact and then other people can access that and say, wow, look how they use their voice here. Look how those students have been empowered to tell the story and cover the situation. So that's really what, that's the first thing I think of. Additionally, if they are censored, you know, sorry, I'm gonna preach to the choir here, but the um, student press rights committee's panic button as well is that they can hit and we can help them with that. And one of the first things we do is send them to uh, SPLC. So we, we provide more emotional support, I think, and they do the legal, so. One of the things I did in a workshop in Ohio was essentially go in and tell, say we were going to talk about depth reporting in, in a press association workshop, you know, for students, and had them pick one story that they'd never been able to talk about, that they felt they'd really like to see covered but never felt they could, and then make plans, the whole group, of how they do it. And so I was trying to be proactive to give them a model. You can do that story. You should never be afraid of any story. It's all in how you do the story. And I don't, that doesn't fit exactly what you're asking, but I was trying to say, show them there's a way. George, one thing I think is valuable too is just giving them a safe space to relate their censorship stories. There's some people who are never going to call the SPLC because they just don't feel comfortable making that big a deal out of it. They don't want to fight it, but just to have their story told I think helps give them yeah. a little more courage when they see the support. I vividly remember when I was in Alabama talking to the High School Press Association <laughs> there years ago, a student stood up in a session talking about Hazelwood and the like and described how her school administration would not allow them to put the score of an athletic event 
in the headline if the team had lost, if their team had lost. If they won, they could put the score in, but if they lost, you had to bury that somewhere in the story. And, and, and again, I thought that is exactly the kind of example that would make everyone say, we have to put a stop to this, but that was a student who was never gonna feel comfortable enough um, you know, talking to the SPLC or pursuing it as a legal matter, so. Questions, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to speak to um, two things. One, and Eric mentioned this earlier as far as the way the Kansas Association um, and many of the associations celebrate, you know, student press freedom wins, you know, whether that's a specific piece or administrators who have stepped up. And so as a, as a state association, we keep adding awards like that. But then also like to speak to the revolving door of advisors and really, for many of us, like the revolving door of members of the state association, which is largely a volunteer position, you're trying to reach out to advisors who might be teaching four other preps, you know, first and foremost on their mind is not how can I spend my weekends and nights and breaks getting involved in student media. So we've tried a lot of different things um, in Colorado. Um, aside from our, just our workshops, we've tried having events, you know, thinking about when to have the events sort of a traveling road show of sorts where we go to the schools. We've tried things like everyone on the board is going to pick one person this year that they're going to informally mentor and try to get them to come to one of our events. But then I think we have to give a lot of thought as study, state associations to the quality of the events, whether they're student and advisor events or just advisor events like, hey, let's get together, talk about photography and go out for some drinks or something like that. Um, when they do spend their time with us, hooking them at that, at that event and making them feel part of this family. So then they say, okay, I'm teaching four preps, one of them's journalism, that's only part of my gig, but now I feel a part of something, so I'm gonna to continue to do it. And those little pieces that a state association can do all year long just go a long way, I think. That's great. I would, I would say real quickly that uh, in the last couple of years, as an advisor, I've started attending the North Dakota Newspaper Association symposiums, workshops, and just in October, I brought a couple of boys with me. Uh, to, we are working on forming a college high school combined press association, and we did it at their meeting, their symposium. Uh, so we had our meeting, but then the kids went to the different workshops and participated, and they were... 100% embraced. Uh, we plan to bring even more students. They welcomed us to come back. We have a joint South Dakota, North Dakota symposium in the spring, and so they wanted to bring students. But the cool thing was, is like you said, they, and John, both of you said this, they need to be able to talk through their ideas without fear of you know, being censored or shut down, and this is a perfect place for them to do that. You're working with editors from across the state and a couple, an older couple, who are, are the editors of a paper in Linton, North Dakota, when it was all done, came up to my students and said, hey, um, right now the pipeline protest is on the other side of the river from Linton, but if it crosses the river, would you guys come write it for us? Because we, they're a little afraid to write it themselves. It's a small town <laughs> and they would feel better about a student coming in and, <laughs> hey, who can censor that, right? And so that's a great bridge there. Plus, NDNA is a big supporter. I mean, we're looking to them for um, support for the, our new media association. Am I good, Frank? I love that idea. I, 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 I was just joking, like, like when you said they're, they're worried about getting censored by, I guess, what, their advertisers and subscribers? Or? Yeah, right, exactly, yep. Any last questions for our panel? Vince, up here. I had one more almost got it. So one of the concerns that I have had since I teach in a suburban school is to always do whatever I could to make sure that the that the makeup of the the, the staff of the newspaper is reflective of the student body. And I, I went to a uh, symposium here about a month ago, hashtag journalism so white, and uh, <laughs> and uh, I was absolutely blown away by the the quality of the discussion and the level of the discourse and how open and frank people were about that concern in the Seattle area, and 
it struck me that um, around this recent election that the students um, had two, an op-ed editor and a staff member decided that they wanted to hold um, a, a debate on, you know, get some students who were uh, Trump supporters, students who were Clinton supporters and, and hold a debate. And they did it after school and they did it very well. And I really feel like they could do it, but teachers and administrators probably couldn't do that. And I'm just wondering if this conversation that we're having, if we could be, if we can be more effective at making sure that we are reaching the voices that aren't always represented uh, in ways that they should be, that are more reflective of, of the audience. Um, because I think they have, and I, I can't say for sure, but my suspicion is that there are a lot more stories out there that are not being told because these are, they represent, uh, like I have transgender students, I have, you know, uh, all uh, students from different religions, different, you know, cultural and racial backgrounds that it's those stories that I am bothered that we're not maybe hearing yeah. in other places. And I know that I live in a, and teach in a fortunate environment, but I don't think that that necessarily occur, occurs even in my neighboring school, so. I don't know if there's any strategies out there to make sure that we're That's a great point. being as inclusive as we can, but. We're still working on being more inclusive. However, I actively recruit, and my students of color actively recruit. I have a girl who's a diversity editor, and I put my arm around her last year, and I said, what do you see here? She said, I see a lot of people working, and I'm like, yeah, but what do you really see? She's like. I see too many white people. I'm like, yeah, so let's fix that. So, you know, I very much employ the students I have and the ones who are like, this is great and this is fun and you need to come on too. I take people with, I usually have them do the intro class first. I fast track them. I put them up with a buddy and a mentor and go that route because I, I believe it's, it's, it's very, very, very important to me because I do believe there are voices out there that we're not capturing. And one of the things that we, we just had an incident in our school in which um, a boy allegedly pulled a hijab off a girl. It's been a high, that's why I'm on my phone sometimes. Um, <laughs> but my students are actively writing about this and I've got a, a, a girl on staff who's Muslim and she's talking about how, why that's important to them. So then they're getting that voice out too. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you can tell those stories adequately unless you have people represented on your staff. And I agree, it's something I think as a collective, we've got to fix. And I think, you know, as we look at testimony in our state capitals, mm -hmm. that, that audience, the, the students who come, it's very important to make sure that the inner city schools are, are represented. We have a, a terrific school in, right in the middle of Seattle that's be, now got a really vibrant um, student media program thanks to an advisor who uh, African-American advisor who is a former Seattle Times uh, staffer who is now teaching. Um, and she's got this amazing group of kids who are passionate about what they do. And I mean, there are other schools in our area that, I mean, getting those kids on board to come to Olympia and one or two of them uh, making sure that they have a chance to testify as long as other people don't sign up ahead of them, um, <laughs> um, and pack the you know pack the hearing room with with all kinds of students, so that legislators can see that this is important. Um, student voices are important, and we're talking about all voices. So, um, so that's something that I know that I'm going to be trying to to work here in the next several months, because I think that's important too. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, Wendy, last question. Oh, wait for the microphone. Okay. <laughs> Wendy Wallace with the Pointer Institute. Uh, the title of the session is Getting Advisor Students, Scholastic Press Associations Engaged, but I want to add a plug for getting the professional media engaged, which is the reason that I'm here. Rebecca and I have talked quite a bit about how state press associations can help uh, help me figure out how Pointer can help. I just wrote a note to, my, to the president of Pointer, Tim Franklin, and to Ben Mullen, who's the editor of Pointer Online, pitching a story about this using Kimberly Yee as the peg. I hope that's okay, Frank. Um, 
because that seems to me like a place where, where Pointer Online can share this story and what's next and give the story a chance to talk about what's already happened too. So this is not a question, it's just a plea for all of you. If you see other ways that Pointer or through the vehicle that we have, Pointer Online, can help this movement succeed, let me know. That's excellent. And Thank I would, you. Oh, go ahead, John. I would second that with uh, groups like SPJ and even JEA. When, your states are, when you and your states are working on this legislation, JEA will endorse and has endorsed either ones we are, are know are in progress or ones that we have been asked to endorse. It's yep. a matter of letting us know and we'll be happy to support and reinforce and do anything you would like us to. But I think the same with SPJ. They did, they did a uh, generic endorsement of state legislation, but I think they're looking for other ways to be involved too. Yep, and real quick, uh, JEA, I know at one time Ka Carrie Faust was working on administrator stories, uh, uh, administrators that support uh, student free speech, and I know I wrote something about my superintendent on there. Is that on the JEA website I, still? Or? It is. It's it principles is. in the press. Yeah, yeah. so that's a good resource. Okay. Yeah. Excellent point, a good transition to what will be our next session, but we're going to take a five-minute break.